national champions Syracuse that 3-2 final. Three red cards issued to Panthers as well, including their assistant coach, Zach Cholofsky. All right, we are ready to go here on a nice night for some soccer with temperatures in the 60s. As the ball immediately goes to the keeper for Denver, Isaac Nami, who has been fantastic, the sophomore from Colorado Springs. Earned his fifth clean sheet of the year on Saturday, making three saves in that 2-0 win over St. Thomas. And what a quick turnaround that is. I mean, Friday to Monday is pretty tough, but then you factor in Saturday to Monday. Early opportunity here for Denver. Center it back to Tyler Schomer, was looking for Dylan Aku coming up from his right back position. And the intercept and clear for a moment here from Pittsburgh. Pitt had to get that right, and you were talking about the quick turnaround. It's mentality. Yes, your body's going to be feeling it, but Jamie Franks, if I know him well, which I do, he will have this Denver Pioneer team looking to get on the board early. O'Fenry oh, centers, finds his target, man goes down, but no call from our referee, Dimitar Chavdarov. Did it pretty well there by Felipe Mercado. Massimo Marania wearing number 23 in white. Who did not play on Friday. Three players for Pitt did not make the starting 11 or see any time up at Syracuse. But when you talk about key members like Rafael Sealy and Luis Samkow out, Abdule Toure will not play as well. He also has a hamstring knock just like Samkow does. And then Michael Sullivan was the other player who picked up a red card. Him and Sealy are both suspended for this match. And it really puts Pitt behind the eight ball against the number 19 team in the country, Denver. It also allows for a chance for the likes of experienced players like Philip Merkovich getting on the bar right here to put their stamp on the game. You have a responsibility when some of your key members aren't available to really be that force in attack and also on both sides of the ball. Yeah, Merkovich has had such a strong season. Also 25 assists in his career, which is one away from tying the pit all-time record. It was 26 set by Eric Prex back in 1994, a mark that has stood for now almost 30 years. Hmm. Wow. There's Thorson. Comes down to Marania. Send it out to the side. Noah Hall getting forward. Back to the middle. And it's off the post and in. Pittsburgh takes an early lead just three minutes into the ball game. It's the sort of start that head coach Jay Vinovich would want for his team. He's telling everyone to calm down, but these players should be excited as can be. And some newcomers who combine. Keep an eye on Noah Hall. Does good work. Aggressive to get to the end line. For speedy players watching at home, do the simple things well. And if here's Raul Sosa getting in the pocket. A little cheeky behind the back flick. Thank you very much. What a way to start the match if you're Pitt. Getting in the byline, cutting the ball back, getting numbers in the box, and finishing well. Gorgeous. Just in the third minute, Sosa finding the scoreboard for the second time this season. The transfer from Marshall, who has 50 career starts coming into this match. His only other goal in a rout of Flor uh, Fairleigh Dickinson, that is 5-0 on Monday, where a lot of different Pitt Panthers saw the, saw the scoreboard, but this is a, a very different type of atmosphere, environment, and certainly opponent. So important Denver counter here. It's so important to get that first goal. Really settles down the team when you have new players who haven't contributed as much, haven't contributed as many minutes. I remember when we played at Wake Forest, that's something that we kind of prided ourselves in. When we had the midweek matches, or even early week matches, we were playing teams that weren't in conference, maybe with a Carolina or Virginia. It was getting them in, getting them confidence by getting goals early. Thorson stays with it. Pumped it forward in front of Marania, but that will get back to the keeper. Well, Pitt's certainly out 
on its front foot. This has been a place that has been so tough to win for any opponent. That's what Jay Vitovich has built here with at least elite eight trips the last four seasons. They've been to two College World Cups in the last three years. The College Cups, that is. <laughs> and uh, that is absolutely uh, a hallmark of this program, being able to go deep into tournaments, just like in 2007 when you guys won it all at Wake Forest. Oh, he was on with us before this game, all smiles, but make no mistake, as soon as the whistle blows, he's got an intensity about him, he's locked in. I know some of our college teammates that were on that 07 team are watching tonight, and they'll remember some of the extra drills, the 7 a.m.s. And I, I just love his ability to manage seasons. He breaks it up into different portions of a season, and when you look at Pittsburgh last year, they started the season well, then kind of faltered a bit in conference play, but it's turning it on at the right time in the NCAA tournament that makes him stand out and Pitt stand out. Did you find, was it a difference in, in solely conditioning or? Now hold that thought, Thorson into the area and now third away. I found that it was more into the training. The conditioning all happened well before. <laughs> if you weren't fit by the first day of preseason, forget about it. Uh, pack your bags, go to uh, the training room, <laughs> and figure out how you're going to get through the rest of the season. So we came in fit. But when we got to tournament time, when we got to the end of the regular season, it was short and sharp. All the sessions had an intensity about them. You had to be focused, and it wasn't so much going the distance and endurance, but it was the focus and intensity that set us up for success. Jackson Gilman wearing the armband number two, patrolling the left center back position for the Pitt Panthers. Forward for Hall. Gilman, one of the better freshman in the entire country was named the all freshman team in the ACC last year at three assists in the back line for the Philadelphia Union FC Academy product Dorson. Mateo Mayufo the ball for the first time Pitt establishing their possession game trying to draw Denver out the pioneers sitting in a low block, everyone behind the ball, but it's entry passes into the midfield too. And a sloppy turnover for Mercado, but those entry passes in the midfield too, if they can turn and face up, they see a bigger picture, and now you can find the feet of Albert Thorson. That's how Pitt clicks on. Michael, missing guys like Feitosa and Toure and Sullivan, Seeley, Sam Cow. I mean, those are those are names that are responsible for eight goals, 31 combined starts this season. How do you adjust if you're Jay Vidovich? Is there anything you're doing tactically that's a bit different than if those guys are in the lineup? I think you're, rather than going to down the middle and yes, Pitt, they like to crowd the midfield. Usually they have this sense of a box where wide players tuck in centrally. I think maybe utilizing some of your skill sets like a Evan McIntyre, he's got pace, he's got long legs, maybe go out wide. The goal and the first goal comes from wide play and Noah Hall, he's got pace, but it forces you to be more flexible, maybe not go down the middle, utilize wide play more. Cabral Carter has been excellent in goal this season. Sophomore getting his first playing time this year after being behind Joe Vandersar. He kept eight clean sheets of his own last season, but Jay Vidovich told us they have their goalkeeping back to the level that Nico Campithano gave them, getting them to their first ever College Cup back in 2021. Where do you see where Cabral has grown so much? His feet, having the composure to hit that diagonal pass can be a major outlet when you're faced with the press. Matisse Lefebvre, the junior from Lyon, France. He's held up. And Mirkovic is going to draw a free kick. First foul that we have seen called by our referee today, Dimitar Chavdorov. 
Correct call. Jake Smith had his hands all over him. Good recognition of where the space was for Murkovich to just roll his opponent. They'll take it quick. Over the top to Hall. And then there in Smith trying to take it away. Now finally does get it back. The sophomore from Littleton, Colorado. Keeping it in for Bassett. Hall to the byline. And it is going to be a corner kick. First of the match here as Hall did enough to win it for Pittsburgh. No Hall's impressed early, being aggressive to try to get to the byline. If you're not going to get a cross off, get something out of it. And he does so there. Cross it in, looking for the header. Instead, it goes over everybody. Just as far as Mayufo. No pressure on him to the back post. Cleared off the line. Pitt thought it had its second. Interesting to see. There is replay. video review. They, they can check to see if that ball crossed the line and if it should be a 2-0 pit lead. Oh, I would love to see that again because for my eyes, I thought that went in just a few inches over. It's a good cross for my UFO. Both fullbacks being aggressive, getting the width and getting crosses in. It's really disrupting Denver early on. It was so tough to see from that angle, but, I, but I'm with you. Originally, Michael, it did seem like it very well could have been a 2-0 lead. Surprising, though, that they allowed Mayufo so much space, right? I mean, he had all day to try to put that thing. I mean, look at this. It's a perfectly Denver, delivered ball. Denver, they stay so narrow, and whoa, that's not a goal. <laughs> it's good clearance from Dominic look Calais. Look how close this is, though. Uh, it's a few inches before the line, and, and it's Massimo Marania gets his head, towering header at the far post. But Denver, they need to shift out a bit more. They're doing a good job of staying compact, but you have to be more decisive to know where the threat is. If you allow this pit attack, especially their fullbacks, to have time and space, they can pick out the right pass. Terrific look there by our crew, and, and that was... Pretty strong evidence uh, to the contrary of it being a 2-0 lead. Up ahead of O'Fenrin and Carter off his line. He has been playing some football himself. Not just a goalkeeper, a footballer too. We've seen a lot of those clearances so far with him, you know, coming off his line and all the way out of the box to send it away from danger. Jake Smith. That was still rising when it hit the, <laughs> the back wall there. <laughs> Not Smith's best strike. But he does his best to recognize that he had maybe 10 yards in front of him. So it's positive that he took it, but you have to put it on target. To your point about Cabral Carter, I've seen him grow so much more in being assertive of when to come off his line and when to stay against Syracuse. He came up with some big saves being assertive in some of the previous matches, I think he stayed a bit too much on his line. That's something he'll continue to grow in as he gets more experience. Marani on the run. Pitt's so methodical with their passing, too. It just tires out another side trying to break you down, especially late in a match. He comes like chess where you're waiting for your opponent, you're playing the long game rather than some teams and programs you see. They can certainly go over the top as well. Souza's got his brace. Just 13-19 into this match. So versatile, so deadly. The pit attack. It's been one-way traffic for the Panthers. It's not just possession for possession's sake. It's really putting the dagger in the final third when it counts the most. Keep an eye, Philip Murkovich, you put no pressure on him, you pay the price. 
Sosa, he's been clinical. Two chances, two goals. The ball over the top is one thing, but getting your body, establishing position, look at that. He knows where the goalkeeper is, has him out dead to right, and picks out the far corner. He knows that the bounce is going to play his way. Draws two defenders to him. The goalkeeper's there, and he's doubling up this lead. The Marshall transfer showing what he can do. Inserted into the starting lineup because of the red cards and the injuries. And Souza already has a couple. Both goals, third of the season for him here in the 14th minute. So they scored in the third minute. The goal by Souza was the fastest of the season for Pitt. And Philip Mirkovic with that gorgeous assist now ties the program record for career helpers. He's got 26, a record that has stood for almost 30 years. And we've still got a lot of football left here, Michael. We might be seeing history by the time that we hit 90 minutes here today. And wager top dollar on the fact that we probably will, given how this game has started and the intensity. He's a tone setter. Some of the passes and really controlling the tempo of this early encounter so far has really caught my eye. I think also what is so incredible about the Panthers side is that when we talked with Jay Vidovich before the match, he was kind of like us in terms of, I don't really know how this is going to go. I mean, we've got so many regulars that are out. We're going to see what we have with some players that more have seen the bench or not played during ACC play. And they've just picked up exactly where the others left off. It's how deep this team is. It's how good he has them built for the future as well as the present. Super impressive start here against Denver Again, the number 19 team in the country and the number nine team in terms of RPI. He has a style of play that he wants to play and he's not going to back down and move away from it. The possession, dynamic nature, players moving in and out of spaces. That doesn't change whether you're a starter or someone coming off the bench. Smith. That is cleared away. Lefebvre just decided to give the corner. Denver already giving up the most goals they've allowed in the first half this season so far. And we are just 15 minutes in. So, so far, right now, it is uh, master getting the better of the student. But Jamie Franks is turning into a master of his own right, though, the four-time Summit League Coach of the Year. Five straight trips to the NCAA Tournament College Cup appearance back in 2016. In swinger! And they got one back. Jason Baloli rose above the crowd to cut the deficit to one. There's almost a sense of deja vu. We've seen this before only a couple days ago. Pitt taking the lead. And then what undoes them? Set pieces. Denver, that's a strength of theirs. And Pittsburgh, that's become something they need to improve, especially at the back post. Keep an eye on the numbers. Sam Bassett, excellent delivery, flights it up. But Jason Baloli rises up, almost uncontested. He's got a few inches between he and the closest marker. You have to get tighter if you're going to not concede goals, goals like that. Just levitates in the air and does the right thing to knob that down. Too easy of a goal to concede, and game on. We're in the captain's armband, Summer League, Summit League first teamer last year, where he had three goals and two assists from the back line. Well, we see why using that 6'3", 195-pound frame to perfection. I think it's fair to say, though, with Pitt, this is coming and becoming a bit of an area of concern. They gave up two of the goals against Syracuse on corner kicks, and it, it's something I am sure that Jay Vidovich is going to want to shore up before they get too far into the ACC. The goals that they're giving up is coming within the six. Cabral Carter... We've seen improvements in his command of playing out of the back, but it's really the command and presence being in the box. When anything in the six, I like my goalkeepers to come out and claim that. That ball is hanging in the air. As we see more in this game, he's got to be more confident to come out and approach that and be more aggressive off his line to claim. Well, what an entertaining match it has been so far. Three goals in the first 16 minutes, and we may not even be close to done. 
That cross finds no one from Mayufo. Souza. Now Hall. Pass it on his back. Pitt plays it to the back line and back over the end, or uh, the midline, that is. Alex, you were asking right before the goal went in, what does Denver need to do? Whenever your backs are up against the wall and it's not really going your way, you're seeding possession. Set pieces are the great equalizer. Getting the ball, getting a set play, and really playing to your strengths. Look at the size difference of Denver in their attack and even their back line, their two center backs. And Ofrenderen, they have the advantage there. Be more direct, get more set pieces, and then try and get that goal. Yeah, Baloli 6'3", Kalai 6'1", Ofenrin and Bassett are each six feet. Ian Smith, the left back, at 6'1". You do have a bit of an advantage there. And I would have to think Jamie Franks is just stressing, get to the end line, force him to make a play. You know, let's see if we might be able to even this thing up on another corner. Smith. Flipped on for Ofenrin, the NCAA's leading scorer. Stays with it, Carter off his line, and he is upended by Ofenrin. Jackson Gilman definitely took some offense to that. OJ Ofenrin was barreling in on goal. Keep an eye on his eyes. He's looking up when this ball goes up. So now we look at the goalkeeper and oh, it's a nasty little collision. Hopefully Cabral Carter is okay. But when this ball is in the air, strikers typically have their eyes on the ball. And Carter takes a nasty landing on the ground. He has every right to come and collect that. That's what I was talking about. Being more aggressive off his line and oof, takes one off the face, off the turf. Hopefully he can shake that off and take five a bit to make sure he's okay. Carter has been so important for Pitt. But just like you were saying, Michael, I mean, there, there's no foul play there. I mean, you could see O'Fenrin's eyes. I mean, he was probably as surprised as Carter was, you know, that, that there was a collision there. He wasn't certainly trying to initiate it. But, I mean, clearly Carter getting the worst of that encounter. These are two big bodies, and it's almost when world collide with Fenrin, the physical power the frame but so dangerous when the goalkeeper leaves his feet there's nothing he can do and he gets cleaned out by the presence of Ofenrin but he looks okay maybe he catches a bloody nose as part of the cost yeah they've got it stuffed up pretty good almost looks like he has a little nick in between his eyes there on the bridge of his nose Yeah, Carter is going to head back to his spot in between the posts, and each team can get a chance to a little bit of an in-game timeout here, discuss some strategy. Dimitar Chavdarov, the referee, chatting with O'Fenrin, making sure that uh, I guess we don't see that again, which is the goal, obviously. Keep everybody safe. And Alex Perlman, Michael LaHood with you. Pittsburgh, the site for this one, Ambrose Urbanic Field. It's a big non-conference matchup. Not just because it's master versus student, Jay Vitovich versus Jamie Franks, but it's also a huge opportunity for both of these teams, specifically Denver, who comes on the road to what is almost an impossible place to win, especially if you're a non-conference opponent. And also Pitt, a team that's number 27 in the RPI, so you start to think about the opportunity to win a match that really helps you out in NCAA tournament selection time, potential seed, make your path easier. I think both of these teams are NCAA tournament teams. I'd expect them if they continue on the trajectory that they're on, especially given what we've seen in the first 20 minutes or so, that these teams are in the consideration, expect them to see them in the tournament. When you think about that word, the tournament, this could be a matchup we see very much. They, they've already matched up once in the past. And when you play outside of 
ACC conference play, you get a taste of what it's like to play a different style. Whether it be Pac-12 or Big East, I wish there was SEC. I'd love to see how the SEC and men's soccer would do. I think it would be very physical. Mm. Problem is only two teams in the SEC actually play men's soccer, Kentucky and yeah. <laughs> South Carolina. So that, that, that that's an issue. You gotta add a lot of programs, but I'm with you. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> Mirkovic taken down. Referee says play on. Little opportunity for Denver. Still with it. Oh Fenrin threads it through to Aku, and that sails well wide. Carter had it covered from the very beginning. Denver upping the press, sitting in a mid block. Before they were sitting in a low block. Since the goal, they've gotten more energy and turnovers from midfield. Keep an eye on O'Frenrin. Good first touch, springs it out wide, but these are the moments where you have to get your service right. Squandered opportunity for the Pioneers. Fenrin already has eight goals this season. Part of that, a hat trick against UC San Diego, as well as a brace against number 11 SMU. Denver making its first substitution of the match with AJ Francois checking in for Tyler Schomer. Francois, the junior from Austin. Karim's out of bounds off of Aku's foot. I'd imagine a lot more belief in this Denver side after the goal by Baloli. It, it just seemed like nothing was going their way at the start. Sosa collected his brace in just the 14th minute. But Denver is a team that is well tested, very battle tested, taking down number 11 SMU already this season. Their lone loss of the year to Portland, that is nothing to be too Upset about if you're a fan of the Pioneers. And now a couple of Panthers are down on the turf. Mirkovic is able to get up. Mirkovic and Mercado starting to get physical in the middle. Denver upping their press. And these are the parts where they say midfield battle becomes a duel, a physical duel. And if you can't defend them, might as well get physical with them. Especially a player like Murkovic. Yeah, you know, it looked like a foul there originally on Semmelsberger when he tripped up Murkovic. They call it a little bit later, though. It seems like on uh, Jake Smith is going to get the infraction there. One thing of note, Denver making subs. And when you make subs, you typically see players changing positions, especially Sam Bassett. He's now going as the attacking midfielder, almost a pseudo second striker alongside O'Frenner and they they do this halfway through halves or if they're chasing a goal or chasing the game to get back and get a goal on their side. Lefebvre has some help. Yep, there's Mercado. He wanted it, got it. Gilman. Played on for the run of McIntyre. Stayed in. Mayufo. Player down in the box. Wave it off. Souza was the one that was trying to get on the end of that cross from Mayufo, and he's hurt. And that's going to bring the training staff on as well. Seen some pit players go to the ground the last couple of minutes. Good cross and aggression from Mayufo. Second time we've seen him lay one up and say more 50 50. Smith, the bigger player, didn't see much in that one. Souza seems to lose his footing on this turf more than anything. You can do that. It's just a stronger player, bigger player getting in on a smaller player, but. 
This is the type of service that you want if you're Sosa. The ball's hung up in there. Look at the distance he covers. But Smith, that's good defending and does well. Pitt already and it doesn't have some key players because of injuries like Lirme Fitosa, Luis Samcal, Abdule Torre. And Jay Vidovich is going to have to go to his bench here. As we talked about a, a chess match, I don't know what game he's playing <laughs> right now, but Jamie Franks is trying to win something over there as he rearranges the pieces. <laughs> I, I love that. I love seeing little chess pieces there on the sideline. I, I remember <laughs> when we played, you didn't have that on the sideline. You had the old chalkboard. I think we were stoked just to see a whiteboard, and there was nothing like it where you got into <laughs> halftime. I think Jay just kept it very simple and had those private conversations with you 1v1. Twenty-fifth minute. Pitt still holding on to the advantage, though just one goal. Excellent ball over the top for Hall. Poked away. AJ Francois, the sub was the one that got to it, and that's going to bound out of bounds for a goal kick. Well, so much familiarity here with not only the men on the sidelines, but the man in the booth as well. How about Jamie, Michael, and Jay, all part of that 2007 Wake Forest National Champion team. Of course, Michael and Jamie on the pitch. Jay, the head coach, the orchestrator of it all. Incredible memory and surreal to be calling this game and to see both these gentlemen on the sidelines. It's no surprise to see Jamie in the coaching ranks. There's always something about him where he saw the game from the coach's lens always was in Jay's office picking his brain wanting to see the game holistically not just in his position but what was happening with the next opponent what's your favorite memory from that run well apart from the obvious winning it all <laughs> is it is, is it Zach putting it in the in the back of the net in the 70 something oh. minute it has to be up there I would say it goes to the quarterfinals there's a game we played in to win a championship, there's always one game that trips you up, and sometimes it's a national championship, sometimes it's a Final Four. But for us, it was the quarterfinals. We're hosting Notre Dame, had the likes of a Matt Beasler in their ranks and some other players, and we weren't playing our best game. And it's not always your starting 11 that gets it done. It's guys off the bench and a player I want to give a shout-out to, and a teammate, Austin Deleuze, scores the goal of his Wake Forest career, comes off the bench in overtime, scores the game-winning goal, that sets us up to go on and win a national championship. It was the effort of the collective, a word that both these coaches use, but that goal is seared in my mind during that season. Well, Jay Vitovich was upset in 2006 when you guys went out in the College Cup, and he told us that he made the spring incredibly tough, and the whole team responded very clearly. A lot of naysayers didn't think the Demon Deacons were gonna be able to finish the job. And they were proved very, very wrong because you guys were the ones hoisting the cup when it was all said and done. I remember that spring season, not just because of the long runs, but you could feel the shift in mentality. It was being a contributor, being a starter for throughout your tenure and seeing some of the freshmen that were recruited setting the tone. As, as an upperclassman, you can't help but be almost infectious and infected by that nature of seeing, okay, wait a second, these guys are picking it up. I have to take my game and my mentality to another level. And in your career going to three college cups, not many players at all can say that. And I think, you know, interestingly enough, you and Jamie both, they are the exact same class, 2005 to 2008, and a terrific college career going on to be a great pro and now we have an, another player down here for a moment for Pittsburgh that's Sosa the goal scorer for the Panthers seeing a lot of uh, attention 
so far. So it must be so interesting, Michael, to see Jay go up against <laughs> Jamie. I mean, you know these guys have incredible respect for each other. Not only that, Jamie has served on Jay's staff at Wake Forest. So they not only know each other in terms of player coach, but also as colleagues. Those are the small little intricate details that can serve you well in a close matchup like this, especially if you're Jamie Franks. You've learned from Jay as a player, and you spent a seven-year span learning those three of them as an assistant, learning habits. And when it comes to big games, I remember in big games, there's a seriousness about Jay that you can't help but notice. You saw it when the camera was panned to him. He locks in. Jamie, he's more of a communicator, more vocal. And it's just two contrasting styles in the end. Luka Kosamara just checked in for Pittsburgh. Sam Bassett puts it towards the top of the frame, and that one cleared away off the line by Evan McIntyre. Another good set piece delivery from Bassett. They've already cashed in once on a quality set piece. Pitt has to be careful. They're not dropping fast enough. Players are losing their mark. This is where your two center backs have to be more vocal and get the team focused. Go out of bounds for the first Denver corner. It's our second Denver corner. First one, of course, was the goal. So let's see if Bassett can tee one up once again. The first one went to the head of Jason Baloli. Wearing number four. There he is as he enters the screen. And you would imagine he's going to get marked this time around. This low one to the near post. Comes right back to Bassett. And the cross sent away by Kozumaro, who just checked in. Look at the Temple transfer. Good block there. He had to make that block because Dominic Calais was open on that far post. Something about that far post for Pitt. Players being sucked to the ball. Someone needs to take a look over their shoulder to make sure that they're marked up. Now into the 30th minute as Pitt pushes Denver back. They've eased their way back into this match, though, after it was all Panthers taking a 2-0 lead after just 14 minutes on the Sosa brace. Smith away by Gilman. Hall. Stays in bounds on the sideline. Man taken down. And they're going to play on there. Francois. Francois, beautiful big ball. Looking for Bassett, just too far ahead. But it is going to be another corner here for Denver. Pioneers are doing an excellent job of picking out those diagonal passes. Pitt sitting too far back. This was how Denver got into trouble, seeding possession, and what a diagonal ball from Baloli. Even better interception, though, from the pit back line. I'm sure Lefebvre wanted to do a little bit better with it. Bassett once again. This ball is much, much better, and it's Baloli again. This time it sails past Carter's goal. And this time it's even McIntyre who puts a body on him. On the goal for Denver, no one was marking him. Keep an eye on McIntyre. He backs in and does just enough to throw him off. Sometimes if you're late to your mark, just getting up in the air and getting physical contact can throw off the attacker. Aiden O'Toole is going to come in for Denver for the first time. The Summit League honorable mention last year with four assists. So O'Toole for Smith. This first substitution, and then Bryce Willoughby will give O'Fenner a bit of a breather here in the 32nd minute. Willoughby is an interesting replacement for O'Fenner, another big body physical striker, but he's more of a center forward. He wants the ball in the air, and one heck of a set piece target 
If you thought Denver looked dangerous before, they've now added to the arsenal in terms of physical presence. Did take O'Fenrin off, so that should change the style just a little bit in terms of what they're trying to do in the offensive third. Pioneer starting to sit back just a little bit more. Bit of a dangerous ball controlled by Gilman. Carter. Give David Bigger some credit there on the work rate. Flying in. Steps coming on. Denver's really changed the way they've approached the game. They're stepping up and high pressing in the match against Syracuse when Pitt really got on the board and took advantage on the counter and were clinical. Syracuse upped the tempo by pressing, forcing turnovers, and then getting to goal higher up the field. Michael, you thought that we would see maybe a little bit more of that. I was surprised that we didn't see that. When you look at Pitt and not seeing a healthy, full starting 11, that's what I would have done if I was head coach Jamie Franks. They sat off a bit, they were made to pay the price, but getting a goal back really puts energy in your team and gets them on the front foot. Mirkovic, space to operate. He was the one that slung the ball over the top for Souza's second goal. Slowing down the pace. Sent away by Aiden O'Toole. Thorson turns. He could have fired if he had a little bit of space. Mercado does! Just over Nami's bar. A for effort there for Mercado. A little ambitious, but he had the goal in front of him. Punch better from Pitt. Here comes the familiar last name. Yes, indeed, Santiago Ferreira. Not only is he the son of David Ferreira, who in 2010 won the MLS Player of the Year award for FC Dallas, but you would know his brother Jesus, I'm sure, of course, with the U.S. men's national team now, as well as Dallas. Uh, 15 goals, 23 caps. Not a bad mark in his international career so far that is kind of just beginning. I know both father and son giving up goals <laughs> against both father and son, so I <laughs> know that all too well. That is a dubious distinction, Michael. Yes, yes, tackled both father and son. Jesus certainly needs to uh, try to cement himself, get some playing time, because the, the striker position with uh, Fuller and Balogun has become a, a little bit more crowded in terms of the options now that Greg Bird Halter has in front of him. He'll have a good case to make for himself with his team knocking at the doorstep of getting the MLS Cup playoffs with his brother Santiago Ferreira coming in. Look for him to sit in that number 10, almost second forward position and Albert Thornton to get up higher as a number nine. As I said in the open, he can play both second striker and out and out center forward. Looking to find a soft spot there in the middle of that defensive midfield building now for Denver. Pack in the center of the pitch a lot more as they sit back here. Maybe Pitt can find another run over the top like they did with that Sosa goal. Kept away from Mirkovic as well here recently, who is so dangerous with the ball at his feet from really, I mean, anywhere on the good side of the midline. <laughs> Since he started the game hot, it's Sam Bassett that's dropped in more in the pocket, except here, beautiful pass. There was Mirkovic again. Hall. There's Ferreira's first touch who himself has played for 14 seasons in the Dallas FC Academy. What an academy that is. Think of the players that have come through there. Weston McKinney, 
Ricardo Pepe, Reggie Cannon. The name goes on. It's it's incredible the pipeline of talent that they've got, not just in the North Texas area or Texas as a whole, but really expanding towards the whole southern region. That's why I said, imagine the SEC, if they had a men's soccer program, you'd have access to players like that. And especially in the state of Texas. Just so much competition. So many outstanding soccer players and athletes. I mean, who you named is basically a third of kind of the starting 11 for the U.S. national team. Certainly McKinney now playing his club ball with Juventus. McIntyre. Waning moments of the first half in Pittsburgh. Sosa with a couple of goals to start off, and then Bololi got the all-important first one for Denver. Definitely changed the way the Pioneers felt about themselves as well as their play. A lot different chasing two after halftime than one, but we've still got a bit of time left. This is where if you're pit, as you're keeping possession, you see one of the fullbacks always drops back to make a back three. Keep an eye on the movement of Mirkovic. He wants the ball. He wants to get it in these pockets. But oftentimes, as a playmaker, deep-lying playmaker, it's just a subtle shift of your body away from the ball, watching the game develop, eyeing where the space is. It's something that I love about his game. He doesn't have to get on the ball all the time to be impactful. It's finding his positioning, finding the right positioning to then face forward and then pick out the pass he wants. Mirkovic has plenty of space if they can find him. Philip, four assists in that win over FDU a week ago. Assisting on four of the five goals that Pitt scored. It's oh, incredible. <laughs> Doing it in different ways, too. Hall the way of Thorson. Tracks it down. Kalai in hot pursuit. Hall looking for a pocket to play it into. Found Mirkovic for a moment, then dispossessed. Here's Willoughby. Willoughby using his pace. Has Biggers to his right if he can pick him out. And now has to slow it down. Good job by Pitt getting back. Not out of the woods yet, though, here with O'Toole. Wide open turf for Aku. And that was in for Willoughby. They were trying to reward him with that initial run, but he sent it over the bar. The change of pace from Price Willoughby. You want to break a press? That's the way to do it. And they keep an eye on it. As soon as this ball gets out wide, this is what I like my center forwards to do. He is locked in. He's focused. He makes a run across the face of his defender, then just miscues it. He's leaning back. Wonderfully marked by Matisse Lefebvre, though. Yeah, and Lefebvre, I think just being close enough to throw him off is what does it. But it'll be, you may say he could have done better or should have done better with that header. Will it be also 6'2? So, you know, we mentioned those six foot and taller players for Denver making an impact, certainly through the air, where they'll have a bit of an advantage. Tracked down and cleared away by Hall. Denver not at all afraid to switch the field, send that big ball across the pitch and let their quick players track it down. Aku fights to the byline, curls it across. And if Hall got it last, it's going to be a quarter here for Denver. It is. They're fourth of the match already. Pittsburgh's only forced one. This is much better from Aku. He had one earlier. He lost it, aiming for that back post, but the defending from Hall, it's a battle of two smaller players. His defender, you have to just get contact. Keep an eye on that left arm. He knows where his attacker is because he reaches out, he feels him, and that's why he can make the play. 5-7 yeah, versus 5-6 there. Bassett. 
short this time. Now he'll whip in the cross. Another great ball, and it sails just past the post. Kalai inches away from the equalizer. This comes off set pieces. It's been Denver's strength. Their center backs have gotten up. Another uncontested header. This time, it's Kalai getting in there. Just can't nod it to the inside of the post. Nervy moment for Pitt. We've seen some excellent service from Bassett as well. The reason he has four assists to go along with his six goals. Certainly on his way now in his junior season to an all-Summit League type of year. Mirkovic picked out the right pass that time. Spinning, dancing, goes Amara. Such an ease to the way he plays the game. It's as if he's almost two or three steps ahead. It's almost effortless at times. Watching him in possession, watching him out of it. There's a really good awareness of where pressure's coming from and how to deal with it. Has a run. Ferreira. Mayufo arrives, wants it back, does get it. Ferreira again cuts back to his right. Mercado now. Pitt has certainly had the bulk of the possession, especially within the last 10, 15 minutes. Controlling this match. Flag went up on the run that time. We'll talk to Jay Vidovich once the clock hits 45 on the dot and the players go back to the dressing room. We'll get Jay's thoughts on the first half of play. Saw a couple of goals in the first 14 minutes, both of them from Souza, but then gave up one and a big reason that Denver feels like they are very much still in this match. Kozumara. Back to Kalai. He put his keeper in a very difficult situation right there. And really, Nami, fortunate that it's just a throw in coming. These are the moments where you have to be that much more focused. So easy to take your eyes off the play or make a mistake in your own box and set your team back. Mercado, Ferreira, McIntyre. Low cross in, takes a couple of deflections and bounds around before McIntyre puts it into the arms of Nami and the first half comes to a close. Box office at the beginning with Sosa's brace. Same time, let's remember, they only played Saturday in Minnesota and then came all the way here to Pittsburgh to match up against the Panthers in one of the toughest places to play in the entire country, Ambrose Urbanic Field. Back underway here in Pittsburgh. Something also, Michael, I don't know exactly how much impact it has, but you know, Denver used to playing on grass. They played on grass at St. Thomas and, uh, or actually, I think they played on turf, but you know, at their home field playing on grass. This is a turf field, although it is an excellent turf field. They put in new FIFA approved surface in about four years ago. You saw, you know, they water it just like grass. It has a lot of those same characteristics. Does that change what you do for Denver? It absolutely does from a standpoint of, you've seen how potent they can be and dangerous they can be on the counter. And they showed it towards the end of a half. 
maybe launch the ball forward a bit more, play for second balls. I think that's where they really start getting back in the game, forcing turnovers. You know that Pitt wants to play out of the back in the build out. Can you high press and really force a turnover? Because now you get to goal. Denver threw it straight into Lefebvre. And that's going to last touch Thorson. About midway through the season now, and you know, Pitt sitting at number 27 in the RPI, Denver number eight, both in excellent positions to make the NCAA tournament field. But when you talk about a Pitt team that has been to two college cups in the last three seasons, it's not about making the NCAAs. It's about where you get seated, the type of path you have to get back to a college cup. And that's why this match, even though shorthanded and not a conference game, makes all the difference, you know, when you think about the NCAA tournament resume. I can tell you this from experience. It's one thing to get in the tournament, but as you progress through the rounds, and you saw it last year for Pitt, they go, they win the first game, then they have to go to Akron to win a game. They beat Kentucky. When you get to the quarterfinals, even the round of 16, you want to have home field advantage. I think that's been one of their biggest strengths is playing games at home, which then becomes a trampoline, and almost a sure thing given their home record to get to a college cup. Absolutely. I mean, there is no doubt about it that it is difficult for them to come in, the opponents to, to beat Pitt here. Jay Vitovich has turned this place into uh, a a type of environment and atmosphere that is befitting of a program that has become a national power in men's college soccer. Remember that at Spry Stadium and he used to call them those Spry Nights and remember we changed, we used to play games freshman year on a Friday night and I know I love those, fresh, those freshman year Friday night games for many reasons, but to entertain, but when he changed them to a Saturday, there was something it just grew on you as a player. You wanted to get out there. You wanted to play, not just for the program, but for the local community that came to watch you. It gave you a small sense of what it was like to become a pro. And the landscape around soccer, too, in this country has changed so much since when you played, Michael. I mean, it's just grown by leaps and bounds. And it's not surprising, you know, that the local community would come out here and embrace this team so much. Thorson went down, a lot of contact. We're going to see our first booking, I believe, here. That is exactly what happens as Biggers is shown the yellow card. Clumsy challenge from Biggers. Comes in late. I forget to spot on. A bit over eager. Thorson's there, and when he rolls it back on, I think he slips, but can't be slide tackling by the Sideline, that puts a player in danger. Yeah, that, that was a dangerous late tackle there. Thankfully, Thorson is no worse for the wear. His figures is carded. Now, we didn't see any cautions in the first half, but it only took us three and a half minutes in the second <laughs> for our referee, Dimitar Chavdurov, to take that yellow card out of his pocket. Discipline a major issue for Pitt on Friday night against Syracuse. It's a reason they don't have two of their starters right now. Sullivan, Seeley banned for this match, as well as their assistant coach, Zach Shalosky, who, of course, was your former teammate, scored the game winner in the College Cup championship. And there's Seeley on the left, Sullivan on the right. So they're, they're in the house, but not on the pitch. And that's unfortunately where the Panthers really need them to be every single match. So this was an accumulation of yellows for Sullivan, but coming up the, the one from Sealy was not exactly what you want to see. Shalosky thought that that ball did not go out of bounds over the end line. The referee thought otherwise, showed him the card. And then Sealy for stepping on Nicholas Kaluki and got the red as well. Just a one-game ban, so should be back against North Carolina here at Ambrose Urbanic Field on Friday night. Kind of feel for Zach Soloski. I know this is a game that he probably would have been looking forward to. It's always festive when you get to reunite with former teammates. 
He wasn't thinking about that, though, uh, on the pitch at SU Soccer Stadium. I can tell you that much. <laughs> no. The Z-Man, as we call him. not? The Z-Man is a competitor. He's fiery. He's <laughs> he was one of the smartest players I played with, and it showed when he won us the national championship. Remember the year before, and when we were in the final four against, oof. That is a late challenge by O'Fenrin. He'll be lucky getting a yellow, and he does. And now we're seeing the cautions fly here from our referee. It's back-to-back -back challenges. We've seen Denver in the fifth. It's a loose touch, but when you leave your feet like that, he lunges in. If you're going to lunge in on a tackle, especially when you're going to press, you shouldn't do that. I know there's an eagerness to get there, but he's already committed. And when you tackle and lunge in on this turf, your body's going to slide that much more. Unfortunately, the fifth gets up because that could have been worse. He's fortunate though the lead foot didn't make contact because the studs were up on the lead foot. I think the referee, there's consistency to the calling of both of those yellow cards. I think he got it right with the yellow. Red would have been harsh. If his second foot would have come in, then that's a clear red. But because even though he led and the studs were up, he did attempt to play the ball. The timing was just a fraction off. So two yellow cards in the last 90 seconds now for Denver. They are continuing to pressure this back line of Pitt. This is the non-conference closer for Denver. Pitt still has one more match against Duquesne a little bit later on in the season, but other than this, it is Summit League play where Jamie Franks will look for yet another Summit League title. He's already the four-time Summit League Coach of the Year, taking his team to five straight NCAA tournaments. Things have really turned around in Denver since he took the helm. It's an incredible achievement in such a short amount of time. When he first started, it's one thing to have that college cup run. Back to that in a bit. Pushed on beautifully, but the pass was behind Ferreira. And bounce out of bounds for a throw. It's one thing to have that college cup run. And on that team, you have Andre Shinyashiki, who still plays in the MLS and amazing career that he's had so far. But to be consistent, that's the next level for young coaches. Consistency, not just in getting to the NCAA tournament, but being the big dog, the top dog in your conference. That's why he has those coach of the years. Nami off his line to snare it. Why has Jamie Franks been so successful so early in your mind? It's down to recruitment. That's how you maintain the consistency. You maintain the standard He's a player's coach. Tactically, he's got his team, but he's a motivator. He was in the locker room. He could motivate us, and he held a high standard for himself and for the rest of the group. And it was almost an extension of the coaching staff the longer we were in Winston-Salem. What Jay Finovich said about Jamie, he said, kind of joking, but kind of serious, that he knew more than I did about the game at that time when he was playing. <laughs> Which is hard to believe, but... I don't know, from what we've seen of him as a coach, might even be true. They play on with McGowan. Kyle McGowan dancing outside the box. He gets taken down with a lot of contact from Hall. And now Pitt finally clears away, but they're gonna stop the clock for the injured pioneer, Sam Bassett. Seen a couple challenges come flying in and an eye on Hall. It's knee to knee on that one. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Bassett wearing the captain's armband this season, coming off of not only a brace against St. Thomas, but he also had one against number 11 Portland in Denver's only loss of the year. But you're talking four goals in a three match span. He is in terrific form coming into this match against Pitt on the road. He's the type of player that there's a reason why he wears the armband. 
He's more than a midfielder, a goal scorer. He's a game changer for this Denver team. So much goes through him, whether it's taking set pieces, scoring goals, assisting goals. It's really impressive, young man. Ferreira held up for a moment. Continues his run. McIntyre arriving. Back to the middle. And Pitt has the two-goal advantage once again. Thorson. Filling in in Sam Cow's number nine roll with a plum. And credit to Santi Ferreira. Look at the movement. He keeps this play alive, moving off the shoulders. When you have a low center of gravity, it's an advantage for you to get in the final third. And then even McIntyre, the presence of mind to cut this back. Thorson, the checked run, sends all the Denver defenders. Look at him, four in a row, he checks his run. I said, keep an eye on his... You could absolutely tell that was going to be major trouble for Denver once Ferreira started that run. And then he found McIntyre on the byline, beautifully sent it into Thorson. And the Norwegian international finishes the job past Nami. That goal almost could have easily not happened had it not been for Ferreira. He bounces off defenders. He evades one tackle by getting in the right position. He has his head up. When the buildup is happening, he knows he doesn't have to check to his left and check back to the ball. That's next level play. And I think that's some of the stuff you learn when you play for the FC Dallas Academy. They teach you spacing, not just running with the ball, but when you have your teammate running in advance, you don't need to come back. Get up, get to the next line of confrontation, and then you create a 2v1 all over the field. So Bassett, after picking up that knock, has to check out. Semmelsberger will come back in. Losing a bit of offense there, to say the least. As Denver goes over the top to Ofenrin. Flag stays down, and a vital clearance from Lefebvre. Carter was in trouble for a moment, but he got it away to Mercado. Sometimes pitches makes it look so easy. Pitts had a couple of those moments where it's been last, just last ditch defending, excuse me. It's bailed them out. Those balls over the top, the athleticism and the difference in athleticism, that's a strength for Denver, especially with OJ O'Fenderin. Keep an eye on Carter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Almost like you're playing 5v2 in the Rondo. Very cool and composed, had to be. From the young man. Open up a lot of space now in front of Hall. Out wide, Kozumara. Mirkovic. Two man game now with Kozumara. Ferreira. Probes are out for the Panthers now, but it's taken away by Denver. They can counter here with one big ball, and Thorson shoved down. McGowan, I believe, is who that was. It was Kyle McGowan. That was quite the professional foul, because I think Denver would have been off to the races. Yes, his hand was up, but you could argue that Thorson was playing the ball there. Yeah, smart foul from Thorson. You are right. They had a lot of players down this left-hand side. Pitt, keep an eye on their high line. When you play possession teams, they tend to play a high line because they want to get more numbers in attack where there's a price to be paid when you turn the ball over, especially given what we've seen from Denver being lethal on the counterattack and more dangerous. The only goal of the match so far for Denver did come off of a set piece. There's a bad giveaway, but... Cool, calm, and collected. Nami sends it to his teammate. Both goalkeepers showing. Yeah, that was close. And oh. there's the jersey grab. And yeah, that is I, 
a textbook yellow card on Kozumara. <laughs> Looks like a rugby player. Both goalkeepers. It's just ice in their veins. Not the best back pass from Smith. I tell you, if I'm either coach, I'm pointing to the stands. Kick it out. Kick it out. Don't play like that. But confident goalkeeping with the ball at their feet. First yellow of the match there for Pitt. I just have a sneaking suspicion that this match is not about to end 3-1. That gave that away. Call me crazy. <laughs> Pitt has already had this two-goal lead. If you're just joining us, Joao Souza with the brace in the third and 14th minutes, putting in his second and third goals of this season, but then Bololi came back just two minutes later with a header for Denver and now this advantage open back to two goals once again with Thorson and his third goal of the year. Smith, Hall excellent in defense. It's been quality tonight for a young player. He isn't back down from any attack. He's gotten stuck in when needed to and contributed with the first assist in attack. Jay Vinovich is gonna be pleased with him. Well, there's no doubt that Jay knows Noah Hall can perform at this type of level. He even told us candidly, he hasn't seen as much time as he should have just because of the players that are in front of him and the type of quality that they possess. And we're seeing what Hall can do with some extended minutes. You never know when you might need to make a formation shift and I've seen it as a player playing for Jay when it comes to tournament time there's little tactical adjustments that he makes that can really benefit certain players that may not be in the forefront of his mind during the season but you never know when your name is going to be called upon Zach Shalosky is one of them he was coming off the bench for us and he still contributed throughout the season but he played the biggest part in Wake Forest history and that's why we have a championship well, and come tournament time, Michael, it really is all about the matchups, isn't it? Absolutely. One player can give you speed where another player can give you better possession. But for Nora Hall, he's shown an aptitude to defend well 1v1, but also get up and down. His ability to cover ground, make the right decision in the final third is something that's going to keep his name in Vidovich's mind come season end. And also playing away from the you know the other team strengths at the same time which is so crucial when you know you get to a college cup and, and both teams are so good at doing what they do if you can take away what they do just even that tiny little bit it gives you a huge edge I saw that last year with iu and this very pit team yeah indiana throughout the years they just find a way in the top programs throughout the years find a way to just make it difficult for the opponent knowing that once you get a half a chance you know you have lethal attackers you get a half a chance you know that you can play your game and really lull the opponent into a trap which benefits your team and it might make it even more impressive with what Jay Vitovich has been able to do that time Tyler Schomer was pushed down by or Mercado was rather. You look at who they lost from last year's team. I mean, Valentin Noel in the MLS, Bertan Jackson with Real Salt Lake. You've got Rodrigo Almeida, Captain Jackson Walty. And then, I mean, you don't even have to mention that, you know, that there are other guys in, in 2021, the year before that you lose, like a Nico Campithano, like a Jasper Lofelson. And every single year, it just seems like Pitt is in contention because of the system that has been built here and the type of recruiting that Jay's been able to do. And that's what made college soccer, college soccer. Go back to when we were talking about Jamie Franks and what's contributed to his success. Yes, you can have all the tactics in the world, but a big X factor is recruitment. Having players that buy in to a tactical system, how you want to play, but the culture. 
Jay is a culture setter. That's what made us successful in Winston-Salem. And there's a saying that he said, winning people make winning players, and winning players make winning teams. And I know I had to learn that. I had to change how I approach being part of the team <laughs> to be a contributor in the ways that he wanted me to. Ferreira certainly making an impact once again. Hall past everyone. Excellent ball to the back post there. Tomorrow, the Nothing But Net crew will look at every ACC school's upcoming basketball schedule, tipping off Monday, November 6th. They'll break down the women from 7 to 8 Eastern and the men from 8 to 9, only right here on the ACC Network and the ESPN app. Looking forward to the uh, ACC SEC challenge. Those dates just came out. Missouri and Pitt. We already knew who the teams were going to be. We didn't know exactly where we were going to see them. That's an ESPNU game. So circle it if you're a Pitt fan. Tuesday, November 28th. So right after Thanksgiving, 7:30 Eastern ESPNU, Missouri and Pitt. There's some excellent matchups. Uh, I've got my eye on Duke and Arkansas. That's a battle of top 15 teams. Miami and Kentucky. They're both right around number 15 in the preseason rankings. It's crazy how it, it just seems like time flies by when we're in the fall. And then I know, every it's single sport season. <laughs> yeah, all the big sports are all just happening at once. Smith, Waldorf, Thorson. Willoughby for Denver. Sixty fourth minute, Pitt has regained its two goal edge. Denver has only dropped one match this entire season. When they went to Portland, the number 11 team in the country, and fell 4-2. Wouldn't be surprised if there were some tired legs after playing a league match on Saturday. Opened up their Summit League campaign with a 2-0 win over St. Thomas on the road. I think you're starting to see some of that. Gave Jamie Franks, Michael, a lot of credit. Uh, for scheduling this match. It can be easy not to, but the emotional bond and the special ties between these two coaches, this match is always going to be scheduled. And this isn't just coming out here to make up numbers for head coach Jamie Franks. He wants to win this game. And I think that was a big confidence boost for them last year to get a draw out of this and to be on the front foot. They came out and came out swinging and Pitt had to fight for everything to get back in the game last year. Third all-time meeting. The first one was in 2019 when Pitt took it 3-2 in double overtime. And then last season, the 2-2 draw. McIntyre was toe-poked away for a corner by Aku. He's making himself a bit of a nuisance on those backline runs. What a brilliant diagonal out to him. Just pinpoint accuracy. In the first half, there was a lot of stuff coming down the right-hand side. McIntyre was a bit quiet. Now he's getting involved in the game. Got the assist on the third goal. For the corner, looks like we're going to have a couple of substitutions. So here, Dyke checks in for Evan McIntyre. As Mirkovic readies for the corner kick. Ready, Sorry, Sorry, go. Go. Get a call. PJ, PJ. Short back, it goes to Mirkovic. Mirkovic faked with the left, now throws it in with the right. And headed away. 
One more try by Ferreira. Right into the hands of Nami. Another excellent ball. Back to back. Ronnie was able to just crosses. get to it. Yeah, back to back quality crosses from Pitt. Keeping the play alive for Ferreira. alleys now. Yeah, it looks like at this point, I mean, Denver is trying to get up a little bit and try to force the action. But it seems like if something is going to come here for the Pioneers, maybe off a counter. Excellent slip through to Dyke. Dyke, back to the middle. A little back heel flip didn't work that time by Maradia. That was... Cheeky and inventive. <laughs> oh, golden opportunity. Unfortunately, he was that. like five yards out, Michael. So it's uh, that's got to be some back heel flip. Yeah. Well, Dyke does everything right. Wrong foot's his defender. But when you're that close, shoot the ball. Too much intricate play in the final third. Aaron Bass picked up, though, here by Francois. Smith circles back. Pitt organizing defensively. Look at that high line they're playing with that back, back four. Smith. And the flag goes up. And there's the high line working to perfection. coming in keep an eye first touch good wrong foots his defender there this is where you've got to shoot it you have a small window of opportunity and when it gets to Moyana, not enough gas on the pedal yeah no hits off his back heel but what might have been if you shoot that earlier yes you want to be team focused and get that pass in but i'd like my wingers shooting the ball in the final third not passing it Sixty-ninth minute now. The only action here in this second half was Thorson's third goal of this season back in the 54th minute. Since then, things have quieted down just a bit. Seen a few opportunities for either side, though. Neither too difficult for either goalkeeper. That's an underrated part of this match, too, with the Nami and Carter excellent in between the pipes. Really fault either goalkeeper for the goals that have gone in. It's been more Not down to the attacking and the how clinical and clean the service has been. And when things are cut back and passes are cut back on the ground, you have to shift your feet. But the cheeky finish through traffic to start it off from Sosa, that's so difficult to keep tabs of. Coming into this match, Denver had given up just nine goals in their first nine matches. It had been very difficult, near impossible for opponents to get the ball past Denver's keeper. And how about that pit already with a trio of goals in this match? Rain starting to fall now here as it pretty much has been doing in Pittsburgh the last three days. It has not exactly been a a weekend to write home about by any means. Not one of those perfect fall afternoons where you go out and you know, go to an apple orchard, get some cider. <laughs> I mean, this is one where you stay inside with a movie or, or watch some college football. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes those are nice, too, though. I like those nights. Oh, 
Denver does not have a shot here in this second half after having five in the first. Maybe it comes right here. Not that time. Wonderfully blocked by Mercado. And shot out of bounds for a Denver corner. Though remember, this is where the Pioneers had their success in the first half. This is excellent work pressing from Willoughby and Francois. They double down and force a turnover, but keep an eye on Mercado. He times his tackle to perfection. Leads to a dangerous corner, though. Here's Smith. Easily dealt with by Mirkovic. Denver can reset. Mirkovic pushed in the back. And Aiden O'Toole is going to pick up the foul there. It's amazing to see, though, Mirkovic's development, you know, from where he started, the senior coming out of Manhattan, and then ACC preseason watch list, a first teamer last year, already now with his assist earlier on, tied for the all-time program lead with 26 of them. And he's still got time left in this match and he's got half a season left. Incredible, the benefit of having that extra COVID year and see the number of games players get to play now. Jackson Walty, all-time leader in appearances on that list that we saw. As a head coach, that's your dream. You want to keep players as long as possible. And I know the team that we had in 2008 that lost in the Final Four. If we just had one more season, man, I tell you, there'd be another star on the badge, that's for sure. Mikrovic's first year was in 2020, so he should have one more season of eligibility after this as well. During the COVID year. Yeah, that, if I was Eric Prex, I would be a little bit concerned, although I'm pretty sure he's <laughs> excited to see that record go down after it's stood for almost 30 years at this point. And saw a pretty successful Panther on there as well in uh, Bertrand Jacasson. the entire front line of pit for a moment. Get it right back. The last couple of minutes, we've seen Mirkovic play higher up the field and interchange and combine a bit more with Ferreira. Denver doesn't know what to do with that. They don't know if it's center back to step out. That was so nifty to Barania as he hunts the back line but it caromed off of him last, kind of pinballed around there. Rania getting in on the action, but that interchange between Mirkovic and Ferreira, difficult to keep tabs of, keep an eye on the movement of Marania. He's been aggressive, been decisive, wants to take players on, but it's just been these moments in the final third to just clean up a bit more. Thorson! Big hit by Mirkovic sails at least 50 feet over the bar. <laughs> 50? Maybe even close to 80. <laughs> I don't think that took a deflection either. Thorson is going to get a seat on the bench. Much deserved. And here's the man with the brace checking back in in Sosa. Good work from Albert Thorson. Got his gold. Did the dirty work for the team. Got a few tackles, forced a yellow card. That's what you want from a player who's playing out of position in that attacking midfield position. Looks more at home when he was playing as a center forward in the front line. Fabian Grau coming in for the first time for Lefebvre as he sits. Great opportunity to get him some, some uh, chances down there. The grad student from Germany. 
played his last four seasons in Germany. He's only played in four matches so far, so make this one his fifth. Excellent battle between two of the premier college soccer programs in Pitt and Denver. Both of these teams could still score a monumental win. Taken right back by Schomer. Flips it onto Aku. Can he catch up to it? No, not before it's out of bounds over the byline. Here's our Week 5 ACC Network Saturday college football lineup. Quarterback Haynes King and Georgia Tech host Bowling Green at 3.30 Eastern. And at 8, the day capped off by our ACC Network primetime matchup, Virginia Tech hosting Pitt at Lane Stadium in Plattsburgh. Both teams looking to break three-game losing streaks. Hokies fell with a surprising loss to Marshall on Saturday. And Pitt dropped by North Carolina in the top 25 as well. They are hoping they can discover somebody under center. That's been the big issue for the Panthers this season, quarterback play. <laughs> 78th minute here on campus at Ambrose Urbanic Field. Opened up in 2011. We mentioned that new FIFA-approved turf installed four years ago. Pitt very adept at playing exactly their style on this field. You have to be careful in possession. You can build out and show that confidence. And this is where the benefit of having a two-goal lead comes in for a group that's coming off a disappointing 3-2, entertaining 3-2 loss from Syracuse. Having that cushion, you get to take more risks because you don't want to risk it all the time. At what point with time, we're almost, what, 10 12 minutes left. At what point do you start being direct and maybe playing for second balls? Carter waited for it to just enter the box before he snared it. Some very winnable games for the Panthers ahead as well. You know, you look at the type of results that North Carolina has put up, especially with what they did against their biggest rival, Duke, last weekend. But first, Denver... Trying to get one back, make it a bit more of a ball game here with about 11 and a half minutes left. So that, that becoming a bit more difficult than maybe you thought at the beginning of the season, hosting North Carolina on Friday, then Virginia Tech at home. So back-to-back -back home ACC matches, go to Virginia, host Duquesne, host Duke. I would venture to say by the end of those matches, Pitt might be looking at itself a bit more towards the top of the table than they are right now in the ACC. And given where both those teams are, Virginia Tech number two in the Coastal Division, North Carolina coming off that massive win against Duke, number three. It's a great opportunity to just strengthen your resume, not just in the conference, but for your postseason aspirations. Not that slow a start for Pitt, but they are 1-1-1. One, one, and one. In the ACC, their win came against Wake Forest, which, sorry, Michael, but uh, <laughs> sometimes that's, a, that's what happens. I'm sure Jay would be much more happy to see a win over Pitt than, or a win for Pitt than a win for Wake Forest there, of course. Uh, tied <laughs> at Boston College, and then we mentioned lost that match to the defending national champion Syracuse. That win against Wake Forest was resounding 3-0 at home, getting goals on set pieces. They've looked vulnerable at times on set pieces, but what a different dimension to know that you can score them and attack. Francois to Willoughby. And the flag is raised offside on Denver. Jackson Gilman there kind of saying, slow down. Let's stay composed. No need to have a bad giveaway and put Denver back right into this match. 
That's what would happen if they scored a goal. Also, once we hit 90 minutes, this match is over. There's no stoppage time, no overtime anymore. So they only have nine minutes now to score two. I'm glad that they've changed the ruling on that. I, I never really like liked yes. For the entertainment value, overtime was amazing, but I like to save that for a postseason occurrence and occasion. There are a lot of teams that really benefit from that maybe soaking up pressure, tiring a team out, and nicking a goal in overtime. But it, it, it forces you to, to do the 90 minutes, kind of respect the game. And for some of the bigger programs, it's more of a chess piece of how you can break down an opponent throughout those 90 minutes than just sitting back and maybe nicking one off a set piece. You know, Michael, it's interesting because I have talked to so many coaches about this issue and it is pretty much 50 50 in terms of coaches that love it and coaches that hate it some love overtime because it means if you're the tougher team or the better conditioned team or the healthier team sometimes you know you've got the advantage in the edge but you know some are just what you're saying you know they they would rather kind of save the legs they'd rather save it for postseason make it a little bit more exciting that way and i think of the development of players for the few players who are getting ready for the next level you're not getting over time in a regular season game at the next level until you get to the postseason so i know the college game in years past has differentiated itself in a lot of ways substitutions will it be Aku's effort blocked away. And now the intercept comes by Deke, or Dyke, that is. Oh, weaves his way through a few different pioneers. Souza. He's going to be fouled. That's good work from Dyke. He's had a couple slaloming runs where he has the athleticism, he has the pace. Willoughby's menaced in behind some of his foraging runs. And Sosa, as soon as he pulls up there, he knows he's being held and clear foul from the referee. Might as well just go to ground and make sure the whistle stops no matter what. <laughs> that was a pretty easy call, though, on the sure crap by Smith. getting a lot of run here in this match. Played 40 minutes in their win over St. Thomas on Saturday, and now up over 53. But less than six minutes remaining now, as Denver's gonna open up, up the bench just a little bit. Rory Frazier for Ian Smith. Frazier, not someone that has gotten time. The redshirt junior from Sugar Land, Texas. Tyler Schomer coming back in. Ultimately, this is a match that, that Jamie Franks would love to have. There's sentimental value. This might not be over for Francois. Right into Carter. So, of course, I mean, you play your former coach, you know, that whole master-pupil thing. You want the pupil to become the master. It doesn't look like it's going to happen here this evening. But at the same time, the most important thing for them is Summit League play, and that resumes as well on Saturday when they host Oral Roberts. And this is the final non-conference matchup for the Pioneers. So, Michael, you can get home, get some rest which is kind of the biggest thing after playing Saturday, Monday, and, and get ready for that pivotal matchup so you can try to go to 2-0 in conference. Denver, what makes them so successful 
is the difficulty of going out to the Rockies, <laughs> playing in altitude, and, and really establishing themselves a fortress at home. This is a litmus test. It's really all it is, a litmus test to see how you match up against one of the power fives in NCAA men's soccer and a team that you could very well see in the postseason, but you don't get to the postseason until you take care of conference play. Well, that's what Jamie Franks was saying, is that you learn so much from this game, even if it is difficult playing Saturday, Monday, and coming up, you can see all of those are Summit League games where they host Oral Roberts, host Omaha. They have that home and home with the St. Thomas this year. And you're right, maybe something that a lot of people don't think about, but you are playing a mile up and elevation is a big deal when it comes to soccer. And it is a, a huge advantage. And that's why you want to have the type of regular season that gives you that home field advantage in the NCAA tournament. So playing these sorts of games tests the character, the mentality of your team. That feeling as a player, do I have enough in the tank? When you do get in the postseason and you do get into overtime, this is some of the best simulation you're going to get. The short turnaround, remember in the ACC tournament championship, you don't have that quite short, that long of time to really rest. You know, if you want to win a championship, right. it's game after game. And then you survive, you get into the NCAA, and it's game after game after that. Semmelsberger. Neither of those really challenging Carter too much in the last few minutes. So Carter's not going to pick up the clean sheet, but he is about to pick up his fourth win as a Pitt Panther and the fourth win of the season for Pitt as well. So they'll get a chance to rest. They don't have a flight halfway across the country to go back to Denver, and they'll get ready to host North Carolina on Friday. Michael, what was the story of the game for you? It's how Pitt started the first half and the second half. Really starting the half well sets the tone for the rest of the 45 minutes. Had Pitt not gotten the goal, it would allow Denver to grow into a game where for about half of the first half, they were on the front foot and they stopped giving up set pieces. They stopped allowing free markers and really shored up the game in the end. Be a corner here for Denver. Those are early goals, making all the difference in that brace. Ended up being enough just by itself. But then Jason Baloli really did make it a match two minutes later. But Thorson's goal in the 54th minute, that's the one that really sealed it. Yeah. The absolutely. game took a different it, it took a different flow after that, don't you think? It allowed Pitt to calm down a bit more. They were a bit rattled when they gave up. The first goal for Denver, it came against the run of play. And once they got that third goal coming out of the locker room, getting it early, it took the sting and the fire out of the game. Phil Mirkovic for Pitt getting an assist, which ties him for the all-time record 26 in his career. We'll talk to Mirkovic in just a moment when this match is over get his thoughts on that and what is sure now to be a pittsburgh win as the final 15 seconds roll off the clock nice way to bounce back after that very tough and hard-fought loss at syracuse on friday and they begin the new week with a 3-1 win jay vidovich takes down his former player jamie franks and the Panthers 